First, I'd uh, like to thank the Academy for the opportunity to make this presentation. And where I fall in the program is to talk about determinants of health in the urban setting. And so first I'll be uh, showing a conceptual framework and then going into a particular example, in this case, uh, housing. And uh, the green, ah, the big one. All right. So <laughs> it is. All right. So we're at the uh, National Academy of Medicine. I'm on the uh, board of Global Health. We're looking at public-private partnerships in the context of urban health. So that's the setting. For the conceptual framework for urban health as a determinant, we're interested in individual and community health. And as uh, Joe uh, put together, a traditional kind of view is biomedical and thinking about the individual uh, components and behavior is certainly uh, part of that. And if we're looking at what influences behavior, we're looking at the environment. And we're talking about the physical environment, which uh, Andy Haynes just uh, uh, really covered very nicely in his presentation. The built environment, the social environment, resource environment overall. When we're looking at each of these, the physical environment, we may talk about climate, uh, uh, air, water, noise, and nature, right? So that's uh, what his talk was about. The built environment, from the uh, international perspective, the global perspective, we think about land tenure and housing, uh, transportation, which we'll hear more about uh, in this meeting, and again, uh, water sanitation and drainage. For the social environment, examples there are the social network, social support, uh, social capital, again, uh, how is it that people are uh, engaged and in interacting with each other? In the resource environment, we used to just talk about uh, what are health services, but we've got to think a little bit more broadly in the social services, food ava availability. Now, in terms of the environment, there are a number of influences on that. Uh, municipal government, uh, business, which I think we're talking about the public-private and the civil society. So that's uh, what I'm going to be engaged with. And then certainly their national and international influences in terms of each of these factors. Now, we could say this goes along with uh, uh, large cities, small cities. Uh, we may think about this in rural areas as well. But what are characteristics that define cities? And there are four that I think of. There's size, density, diversity, and complexity. And what we want to think about is that cities are neither good nor bad. So in terms of size, the uh, uh, positive is just the numbers of people that you can reach in terms of the kinds of programs that are out there. In density, you have people that come in with specialized talents, the diversity, and they have proximity and association, which is directed towards uh, opportunities and uh, accumulation of wealth, which is one of the characteristics of cities. The complexity can be in a excuse me, in a positive way about interlocking systems. And certainly we've seen that in a number of cities where you have intersectoral kinds of uh, uh, interactions. The negative, I think we're all familiar with um, uh, in terms of size, that you have incomplete coverage. Uh, density, you could have overcrowding, negative impact of that. Dispersal, meaning uh, cities are, are growing uh, uh, horizontally as people are coming into cities. Diversity, uh, negative can be social exclusion, culture clash as people are uh, moving into denser areas. And then complexity, as much as you could have interlocking systems, uh, you can also have the sectoral divisions, which um, um, uh, are problematic. 
Uh, in terms of an approach overall, if we look at uh, healthy cities kinds of uh, conversations, for size we talk about universal coverage, density, uh, density is good, overcrowding is bad, right? In terms of the number of square footage and the resources in terms of health. Diversity, you're looking for inclusive opportunities and complexity, the issue, and it'll come up later in the meeting, of good urban governance. And uh, we'll be uh, talking about that uh, a bit as well. So in terms of the urban environment, I'm going to concentrate on the built environment and particularly the issue of land tenure and housing. Now, in 1976, uh, Habitat One uh, occurred and there was the Vancouver Declaration of Human Settlements. And that talked about having adequate shelter and services as a basic human right. The government should assist local authorities in this case, and use and tenure of land should be subject to public control. And again, uh, housing as a human right. So the example that I'm going to be giving is in India. And what we see on the left uh, uh, going down the column are a series of programs. And uh, I'm just providing the acronyms that are here. And then the year, starting with 1966 and coming up to 2015. And then to, uh, government involvement all the way down. But the role of being uh, as being different in terms of uh, implementation itself with the next column, no private uh, engagement, and then switching where, again, government as a housing provider turns into a facilitator and increasing reliance on the private sector for implementation. Now, the civil society, uh, again, there's a mixed record on that over time uh, to the degree of how they're engaged. Uh, government uh, less so, and with privates over time, there was government engagement, but also a period of time where it has been the developers who have been engaging uh, um, the community-based organizations. So on the right, in terms of notes, uh, there's no uh, direct linear path of uh, how this uh, has developed over time. There have been different programs that have taken different approaches. The definition rationale of public-private partnerships, I think, is familiar to this group. And really what we're looking at is voluntary, stable, collaborative effort between two or more public and private autonomous organizations to <coughs> develop uh, products. So the rationale is private sector typically has access to upfront capital, track record, delivering products. The public sector controls the regulating environment and crucial uh, resources such as land. The preconditions involved in these uh, uh, kinds of partnerships usually have to be met uh, before sufficient risks are mitigated. And uh, it could be a change in the law oftentimes has to occur accompanied by feasibility, social, environmental studies, and willingness to pay assessments. The private sector must believe that it's going to get a positive return on investment uh, to, if it's going to be possible. And that means that the public sector role involves mitigation measures to uh, make it a more favorable condition uh, for private to get involved. Uh, there's the example of urban transportation, which we're going to hear about uh, later in this meeting. The role of the public sector conducts analyses, studies to ensure feasibility. Uh, the role of the private investor, uh, again, is to be solicited and implement the project according to a negotiated project structure, and that could be building, operate, transfer, or building, own, operate. And again, they're implemented usually through uh, straightforward, not always so straightforward deals between individual landowners and agency investor. Uh, transportation project can uh, um, benefit from a separate entity that deals with potentially displaced people. Now let's go into slum conditions. That gets a little bit more 
complicated. And that is if you're using that same model of, uh, of using the private contractors to build, you're not necessarily uh, affecting the livelihood of dwellers. You've improved the slums, but not the, uh, necessarily the dwellers. So it's not only the physical infrastructure, but it's also getting opportunities for residents to become integrated uh, citizens of society. So again, you have to apply economic uh, development to residences and, and social development, as well as the projects themselves. So again, um, it's a different dynamic when we're looking at the slum uh, um, housing situation. So we move from uh, public-private uh, partnerships to what are called network partnerships for the betterment of slums. The public sector we already talked about conduct the analysis and studies for feasibility. The private investor uh, implements the project uh, according to a structure. And the non-governmental organization, again, they're tasked with more socially oriented goals, such as facilitating steps to integrate the settlement into a larger community. So the three-way partnerships uh, are interdependent and adaptable uh, between the actors. And in lieu of contracts, many times it's based on trust. So why would a uh, private uh, developer get involved with this? And in some of the cases uh, that are reported, it's really enlightened self-interest. You know, the headquarters of a particular uh, development company is in a city, and so can there be improvement. So the big question as I think about it is uh, how incentivize the private sector to take up redevelopment with uh, which otherwise would not be profitable to them. And there are a couple of approaches to this. One is that uh, the government can make uh, uh, the property more affordable. So private developers purchase the slum land, say at 25% of fair market value. And then the second is redeveloping the land with uh, incentivized what's called floor space index. And that can be a plot of land and expanding uh, the uh, building to the margins or vertical as well. So again, what is required of the developer? And again, it's clearing the land, the temporary shelter, and uh, transportation, right? People are living on the land. What are you going to do with uh, the people that are uh, residents of the uh, area? So that becomes the responsibility of the developer. And then it requires consent of 75% of the slum dwellers uh, in the community. So you have to convince uh, uh, people that this is to their benefit. And then of those, uh, you have to determine eligibility. So there's going to be, in this case, uh, housing, free housing for slum dwellers, but they have to have documents to prove they've been living in the slum prior to a cutoff date. And again, that's uh, thought of as 10 years uh, in a number of cities. So again, uh, the rehabilitation is going to happen on part of the land, and it's free housing uh, for the residents. Uh, in Ahmedabad, um, there's an example here, and uh, the top is uh, identifying some of the areas. There were 12 areas for slum uh, development, and the bottom part uh, is really talking about, uh, mentions what the neighborhoods are, uh, who the CBOs are, and what are the uh, developers. So that's just to show that it was going on in time. So again, there's a also, oh, by the way, there's a three-year deadline to get all of the work done. And that is getting 70% of people to agree, get them eligible uh, throughout the uh, entire process. So there are multiple stages of um, government clearances that have to happen. And, um, you know, the saying uh, is the British uh, uh, invented red tape and Indian uh, embroider with it. And so there are a number of uh, 
levels of um, clearances that have to be had. And then you have to convince residents, uh, allay fears, uh, cooperation and collection and verification of documents. Uh, the residents uh, see free cost of housing, too good to be true. And so there are uh, questions if this is really a plan to have them evicted. So there has to be time uh, set aside for this. So the developers in a number of situations, even though the government did not uh, put it out as a requirement, uh, developers invited non-governmental organizations, community-based organizations that already had a relationship with the community to help negotiate and communicate uh, with the residents uh, who would become the beneficiaries. In addition to all of this within this time period, there's delays that happen for a variety of reasons. There's also litigation. People can say, well, generations back, my family owned this land, and so therefore, you know, they should have a piece of it. And, and again, all to get done in the three year. So what are some of the limitations? Uh, again, developers, more than one developer can go to uh, a particular slum and so there's unregulated competition, which becomes uh, confusing for the residents that are there. Uh, there's no specific standards on the quality of the rehabilitated buildings. Uh, the cutoff date for eligibility for rehabilitation. Um, what happens with the uh, 25 to 30 percent that do not agree? Uh, to go along with the program. And what happens with the people, even if they do agree, if they're uh, ineligible by the deadline? And again, um, these are problems that need to be uh, addressed. They may, if they can't determine eligibility, have to move to another slum. So again, the current model provides free housing to the slum dwellers and the developers have to load the cost of rehabilitation on the saleable components. So there's housing that is developed for the slum uh, dwellers who are now the beneficiaries, but to offset the cost, uh, what happens is that there is uh, housing that is luxury housing to offset the cost. And then one of the unintended consequences is that uh, the middle class is priced out uh, of the area is what can happen. So one example just to show you from Mumbai is on the left is the rehabilitation housing. One of the examples, it's, uh, that's what we talked about is free and the offset are luxury apartment that are uh, three to five million dollars each, all in uh, proximity, which has uh, is issues. The moving from uh, free housing, uh, that's not the only program that's out there and some of uh, programs transition. So the uh, PMA ISSR, uh, there are four versions of this and some is the government gives land uh, uh, and there's subsidy that can go to the developer, to the another program homeowner, to another one uh, to the household and uh, houses bear, um, households bear full cost minus the subsidy. So that's uh, an example. So a slight detour I want to make here, and that is uh, megacities account for 9% of the urban population. There's continued growth in population size, continued expansion. Uh, uh, Professor Haynes talked about that. Uh, Joe talked about secondary cities, growth in the next 20 to 50 years. So again, it's the private of the private public partnership that can bring innovation. And some of the innovation includes those sustainable uh, technologies. So the conventional economy is take, make, waste, and construction waste 535 million tons of debris estimated, food waste 60 million tons. So can we turn this into a circular economy where you recycle uh, as much as possible, throw away as little possible? So again, less produce in uh, landfills, uh, making bu building materials that are recyclable. And there are a couple examples of this. When I first heard about using bio waste, um, I thought of uh, 
uh, that as uh, uh, human waste. And really what it's talking about is using uh, all the uh, produce that's out there in terms of growth. So one example here from Ecovative is introducing mycelium, the mushroom root, to agricultural waste. And uh, when it reaches out to digest it, it forms a matrix of white fibers that grow to become a solid material. And there are examples of this that uh, uh, have been used at small scale. Uh, Biomason is made bio waste. Uh, it grows bricks without the use of clay or heat. Uh, harnesses natural process of producing coral. And so the calcium carbonate crystals are around sand, very strong and uh, good examples. Uh, there are a number of NGOs that have worked with um, of, um, individual communities with private funding, uh, example using solar energy, green technologies uh, to incrementally upgrade the informal settlements, build local uh, enterprise and capacity. Although there are 1,500 um, people in this particular uh, community at 17 jobs at this point. So again, it's what other areas of development can there be for people to financially participate in this change. So again, the public-private partnerships as I'm closing up here, uh, we've talked about the role of municipal, business, civil society influencing the environment at those four levels really gearing towards individual and community health. So again, uh, the only alternative uh, is collective action and really incorporating the grassroots level. We've talked about the 17 sustainable goals of development, and I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the people contributing to this report, uh, particularly uh, Joe Buford. I've really enjoyed working with her and also uh, doing a shout out for the International Society for Urban Health. Thank you. Thank you.